Mark, would you like to handle the questions? You want to kind of choose people and cut them off if they, the statements go too long, that kind of thing. One of the things we all do in this trade is bemoan the, uh, the state of investigative reporting, which if you look at the history of it in the country, it's, it, it rises and falls uh, historically, and uh, it would go through periods like Watergate when everyone is and wants to be an investigative reporter, and the media supports this, and then all of a sudden, it, for one reason or another, it starts to die off. And we're definitely um, in a die off now, investigative reporters, which is why Russ is, and I are both freelancing, basically. And um, so I'd be interested to know what you think is about the state of investigative reporting and its future. Uh, I, I think it's, it's bad. And one of the uh, sort of encouraging things is that there are a bunch of these entities, more of them now, that are nonprofit investigative reporting outfits. And I'm glad to see them on the scene. Uh, and I like the work they do. It's very, very useful. Uh, my only problem with them is that they won't do the kind of stories I'm talking about. They also have to consider the, the, the foundations that back them, where the money comes from. Uh, they need to keep uh, their credibility because it's important to them that they get their stories picked up by the, uh, the corporate media. So I, I'm afraid that is not the solution either. Uh, the only thing I could think of was to start my own thing, and that's we really would like to grow who, what, why very, very rapidly. We're working on all fronts. We've got a lot of people helping pro bono. Uh, you know, if you've got a skill, if you're a, a graphic designer or, uh, you know, you own a restaurant where we could have an event or uh, you're a printer or you uh, are an accountant or anything, we are working with literally scores of people now who are in there helping, others trying to help us raise money. Uh, almost everybody, even if we don't have much ourselves, we can kick something into the bucket. And also, we know people who know people who know people who have resources. And there are a lot of good people in this country who are comfortable or even affluent, and we are, uh, they are helping us uh, function and, and grow this thing. So what we want to do is we want to train another generation of young investigative reporters. We also want to bring in the Mark Dowies, and Mark is on our advisory council, and, and ask them if they will mentor these young people and guide them. Let let them go out and do a lot of the shoe leather stuff, but but benefit from your own knowledge and experience. Don't you know I do it all the time. Um, and it's uh, to check out this website. It's really really interesting. It's www.whowhatwhyisoneword.com, and um, I really encourage you to spend some time with it. Uh, you'll learn a lot. Um, so other questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, how about uh, some people like Glenn Greenwald? Uh, sometimes seems to be able to defy most conventional uh, 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 ideological perspectives and is willing to see that. Yeah, it, it would seem to me that if, if, if he was successful in, in sort of still pushing stories his way, he's phenomenally uh, a gifted uh, writer, I think, and, uh, and uh, it seems to be pretty fearless. I don't know what your experience has been or if you've ever tried reaching out to Glenn Greenwald, but some of the people who you know, like Peter Dale Scott, uh, and uh, David Talbot, that sort of stuff, uh, uh, have reached him with some with considerable success. And of course, he's reached out to them. Um, I, I would think that uh, because they're, he has huge followers. I mean, yeah, I mean, I just. Point, I mean, that's the first thing I read. I, I don't want to get into individuals because there are a lot of them, but let me just say generically that all of the people you could possibly mention are sent our stories, and none of them cover them. Why that is, I can't tell you. But, you know, one of the other problems, I think, is that a lot of the people who may share uh, some perspectives and so on, that, that unfortunately, like every other business, there are a lot of egos in it, uh, and people are mostly involved with their own franchise. We constantly ask people, why don't we work together? Can we find a way to uh, cooperate, to collaborate? And most of the established people are just not interested. They say, I got my own thing, and that's what I'm going to do. Um, so we're, we're okay with that, and that's why we're going to train a new group. I think you hit the nail on the head earlier, too, uh, Russ, when you said that, you know, that we, we produce all this material, um, but corporate media won't touch it. And I think that, that the, the nonprofit investigative groups know that, and they select their material accordingly. You have a question, sir. Uh, with this military industrial government media complex in control, they're never likely to give it up. And we, as uh, even the 99%, 
won't be able with, in, in a physical way to take it over. Uh, the one hope I have has to do with the end of cheap energy, the collapse of this globalization, so that really we should look forward to these institutions that we so cherish at the national level, so that really our focus all comes to the local level and we rebuild here, rather than trying to transform this global journey. But your thoughts? I don't know. I mean, I think it's a little too late to just hide out locally. Uh, everything, uh, probably half of the things in your house come from the other end of the world. So I think we're all linked at this point. I agree. Local is very, very important. But I think it's also important to recognize that we share a great deal in common with people just like us at, uh, halfway across the world and that they're all, we're all being oppressed. You see, this is the thing. We're all being oppressed by uh, power centers that keep it all for themselves. It's no different in China. It's no different in Saudi Arabia. It's no different in any of those places. And I think people in other countries understand that much better than we seem to in this country. We are probably uh, the most propagandized people on earth. Mm -hmm. I think one of the uh, really interesting things you've done recently was the analysis of the New Yorker article on the assassination of bin Laden and especially the questions you raised about the identification of this person who was now dead. And I wonder if you'd like to, you know, that's been several weeks ago now. You know, do you have new information, new thinking? Uh, do we really get your doubts of what it was, Bin Laden or not? Yeah, I mean, I, I actually was, I, I'm very agnostic on these things. I'm very careful not to act like I know what happened, because I don't. And really, you know, this is to... To me, this is the secret of good investigative reporting: is to really, genuinely have an open mind and be open to anything. And you, you know, you got to be okay with the fact that somebody you like or some country you prefer uh, was involved in something bad. You have to be. That's absolutely crucial. This is something I get resistance from people on. They're not happy. This Saudi story, they were not happy with that because they heard stories that another country in the region they believed was behind it. Well, maybe, maybe not. But that that's not relevant to that particular information that we have. Uh, so. So, um, uh, as far as the bin Laden thing goes, all I can tell you is this: they, this lawsuit that uh, that has been filed, where they want to see the photos. Uh, if the Obama administration was interested in settling this, they could simply say, we're going to designate two or three well-respected individuals who will be brought in in confidence and allowed to look at the photos, including a few uh, people who are uh, experts at identifying people, and we'll let them see the photos. Because their whole point is, we don't want to release them publicly because it'll cause uh, unrest in certain parts of the world. Well, obviously, if they showed it privately to certain uh, truth actors in this thing, um, we'd settle the whole thing, but that doesn't seem to be an option, and that troubles me. It means that they really just don't want anybody to see those photos. What about the DNA? They claim they have that. They did, but you know, we also... About that very interesting. Yeah, they claim that they did a DNA on him, but according to the DNA experts, that's impossible because it takes a certain number of hours to get a DNA match, uh, and they didn't have... The, the body was already thrown uh, overboard allegedly long before uh, they, they could have had that amount of... That, window of time. But they could subsequently have an analyzed. No, no. It, apparently there's something where, they, in other words, they announced, they announced his identity from DNA prematurely is what I'm saying. <laughs> uh, presumably, but not if you throw him overboard because now you can't uh, dig him up, right? Yeah. yeah, I mean, one of the things that I've noticed about my peers in, in investigative reporting is that um, the really, really successful reporters like Russ they have uh, an intuitive sense um, that a lot of us don't have. And um, I've had conversations with Russ where he's thrown a theory at me and I've thought, hmm, sounds a little conspiratorial, sounds a little theoretical. They've all proved that, believe me. Um, he has it. And um, the, the most successful reporters do have it, and it's a gift. Um, and uh, I envy them. Uh, yeah, yes. Uh, thank you for coming. I really appreciate your talk. Well, 
Well, I, I mean, I think it's certain that the Obama administration didn't feel that this was something that they could do, that it would be counterproductive. And I understand that from their viewpoint. So I, they're not going to do anything. Uh, if anybody's going to do anything about it, it has to be the American people. And you'd have to have people in the streets. Uh, all of those countries, whether it was Chile or whatever, it was by popular demand that these things happened. <laughs> yeah, sure, why not? He's in the You know, I, I get asked, I kid you not, I think every public event I do, somebody asks me the personal danger or threat issue uh, question, and I have to say, you know, these people are way too smart to do that. Um, if you read Family of Secrets, you'll read an exchange I have with a former CIA officer who worked directly with the, the elder Bush in Zapata offshore. And when I called him and told him who, what I was doing, there was a long silence at the end of the phone. And this is how you know you talk to the right people, just a long, dead <laughs> silence. And then he said, what did you say your name was again? And then I told him, and then he said, and what exactly did you say you're doing again? And then I repeated that. And then he asked me whether he was authorized to talk to me, which is interesting when you call a person who's purportedly a private citizen who only worked in banking. Uh, and so uh, I said, well, who would I need to authorize it? And so he said, well, I've got to call uh, whatever he called him, the big man, big guy, the old man or something, which he did. And then he said he told him not to talk to me. So that's the extent of it, don't talk to him. You know, the, the last thing that they want to do is draw any attention or even indicate that they even have heard of Family of Secrets or read it. Of course they have. Uh, but but uh, they're much much smarter about it, and they they, they if they're going to do something, they would do it in a much more elegant and nuanced way. <laughs> in in the in the the time that Russ and I have been working as investigative reporters, uh, in my case almost forty years, there's only been one American investigative reporter assassinated in the United States. A guy named Dan Bowles. It happened in Arizona early in my career. And what what happened after that was that probably two thirds of the investigative reporters in the country left their desk, went to Arizona, investigated the whole thing, tied the mob, uh, tied, the, the, tied the, the assassins up with the mob in Arizona, wiped it out, implicated Barry Goldwater. They, they know that when we really focus on something like that, um, they're devastated. They're going to be devastated by it. So they just don't do it. And, um, so, and that's where I cut my teeth as an investigative reporter in the Dan Bowles investigation. It was very exciting to see all the great reporters there in one place. Anyway, any more questions? God, every time I read a page. But, so it was great. Um, but with the digital age now, uh, do you think that we, do we need hackers? Do we need hackers? Oh, boy, I don't know. What do you think, Mark? Well, it depends what you mean by hacker. If you, if you mean WikiLeaks people who, who hack material and turn it over to WikiLeaks. Yeah, yeah we do. WikiLeaks are hackers. Sure we do. Well, no, WikiLeaks receive well, no, hacked material. Okay, okay. Yeah. And uh, yeah, sure we do. But just yeah. simply because you use a lot of documentation that was old and on paper, you know, you can't change it. But with digital. Yeah, I mean, this is a whole new world, and uh, I think most of us are still thinking about it and trying to sort it out. I, I have mixed feelings because, of course, all investigative journalists, all journalists love to receive documents, but at the same time, we don't necessarily publish everything that we receive because we want to think about what is this? Do we, are we sure this is real? Do we know who, what the uh, intent of the person who wrote it in the first place? You have to remember that uh, one of Bush's friends said to me when I mentioned that his name was in a CIA document, and he said, hi, he said, don't you know not to ever believe government documents? So just releasing huge amounts of documents doesn't necessarily get us closer to the truth. And I think it's important that that function of vetting and, and verifying that serious journalists do is extremely important. 
And a lot of a lot of leaked documents are leaked deliberately to uh, um, give us a red herring to follow. Yeah. In, uh, when uh, we I wonder if you did any work in conjunction with architects and engineers for a review of 9/11. The people who were involved in the review of 9/11 and the building. Yeah, we 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 haven't. This is our first story. Uh, of course, we're aware of the work done by them and other groups. Uh, that what they have, they have put out. Uh, so I don't know exactly what we would necessarily do. Um, uh, I and my colleagues are not experts in the construction of buildings, so unless we could figure out some new sources or some new avenue there, I don't know what we would add. But we are certainly willing to do reporting wherever we see an opportunity. And that the example of that would be our recent piece on who, what, why about the, uh, the Saudi family in, in Sarasota. You know, uh, the, the, one of the problems, somebody asked about the digital age, you know, one of the problems is that anybody can post anything, and a lot of the stuff on the Internet is false. And a lot of it is not even, it's not necessarily even put up there because people mean it to be false, but because they're not careful and they don't know. And there's just a tremendous amount of stuff in that case, for example, as far as I know, um, uh, one of the brothers of George Bush was on the board of a company that provided security services to the World Trade Center some years before uh, the attacks, but they were no longer doing that uh, for a while, a year or two during that period. That's quite different than saying that he was in charge of security. Uh, and it's just very important to be precise uh, for credibility and, and, and for the public good. Uh, yeah. I mean, we rely on everything. We rely on interviews. We rely on documents. We do a lot of old-fashioned stuff. We try to read books. Uh, a lot of journalists just don't seem to read books. And uh, I, for Family of Secrets, I assembled a library of more than 500 books, some of them extremely obscure, even self-published memoirs of people who had worked for George H.W. Bush. And when I called them up, they said, well, how do you know all this? I said, I read it in your book. <laughs> and they said, well, I thought only my family would read that. <laughs> so, you know, we think you have to use any and all methods. It's a lot of work to do good investigative journalism. It takes weeks, months, years sometimes. And we just don't think you should uh, skimp on it. And that's why we're trying to get uh, who, what, why properly uh, funded because, you know, we, it's not like those news organizations where they can knock out three stories a day. I mean, we're lucky some of our people, if they can do three stories in a year. Well, I just very briefly, there are two things about those commissions. Number one, they never, ever get to the bottom of anything. <laughs> and I can take all the commissions in the history of this country, and has any one of them ever resolved anything? Their purpose is not to get to the bottom of things. Their purpose is to... Uh, settle things in the mind of the public and to and to allow us to move on. If you remember in the 2000 election, even the New York Times started saying, this is going on too long, just give it to Bush, let's move on. And that's an attitude uh, in the sort of prevailing classes of this country. They don't want a chaos and they don't want to stand still everybody back to work. So I have limited uh, faith in these commissions. Uh, there are some good people who are on them and they try to do what they can. Even the people who are on the 9-11 commission say they believe they were lied to and that things were withheld from them. So we've got a big problem and I, and I think those people to some extent, even some of the people in the power structure uh, are very sympathetic to the kinds of work that we're trying to do. Anyway, um, I, I guess we're going to stop now. And uh, uh, we have some books back there. I hope you will not let um, the, your good local bookseller return back to the store with any copies. Uh, uh, get them for uh, holiday gifts, if you like. And uh, hopefully, if I sign them, they'll be worth at least one cent more than they were before. Uh, happy to do it. Thank you so much for coming. Really enjoyed it. <laughs>